Hello, everyone. Welcome back to 84,000 in Conversation, an ongoing bi monthly weekend series where guests drop by to share stories, initiatives, and inspiration to help us understand how the Buddhist sutras can map onto modern life. 84,000 Translating the Words of the Buddha is a global nonprofit, non sectarian initiative with the mission of translating the Tibetan Buddhist canon in its entirety within 100 years, starting first with translation into English. All completed translations are published for free online in 84,000's online reading room, which you can access at 84,000, sorry, read.84,000.co. I'm your host, Joy Chen, and sharing the next hour with us today is Dr. Kate Hartman, Assistant Professor of Buddhist Studies at the University of Wyoming and Director of Buddhist Studies Online, a new online educational platform offering a plethora of courses related to Buddhism. I should also mention that I know Kate from her time at Harvard, where she received her PhD in Buddhist studies in 2020, and where I am currently a PhD student. I've always admired her erudition, her warmth, and her enthusiasm for the field of Buddhist studies and for teaching. Um, in addition to her doctorate from Harvard, she also holds an MA in the History of Religions from the University of Chicago, and a BA in Religious Studies from the University of Virginia. Thank you so much for being here, Kate. I know it's really early in Wyoming where you are right now, so I really appreciate you taking this time to chat with us. I hope you have some coffee or other uh, caffeinated drink of your choice with you. Yes, thank you so much for having me on, Joy. This is such a wonderful occasion to get to, to chat with folks and especially uh, you know, to folks out there in the world who may not otherwise have chance to you know, learn about academic Buddhist studies in the kind of standard way that we do it, at least uh, in the United States. Um, and I'm really excited to, to talk with you today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited. It's been long overdue, this chat. Um, so we're here today uh, to discuss from one millennial to another um, what it means to be studying Buddhism in this new millennium in 2021. Um, and uh, the role of Buddhist studies in the humanities and in higher education at large. Uh, so to all of our audience members who are listening in today, please feel free to submit questions for Kate in the Q&A box, and we'll try our best to get to some of them towards the end of the hour. Um, I think that I would like to begin today by asking you how you came to the academic study of Buddhism. I think everyone I know in academia has had a very different trajectory um, some come from a practice or devotional or cultural background, and I would include myself in that category. And some started this course of study purely out of intellectual curiosity. Some maybe had certain formative experiences that led them to certain parts of the world or encounters with certain people or ideas. So how did you end up studying Buddhism in college and then deciding that this would be your career path? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I grew up in New Jersey and from an early age had sort of a multi-religious background in that my mother's family was one religious tradition, my father's family was a different religious tradition, I was raised in yet another one. Plus in New Jersey, New Jersey has the highest per capita percentage in the U.S. of um, Indian immigrants. And so, you know, I knew a lot of folks growing up whose families were Hindu or Jain. And just from an early age, I was really exposed to all of these different ways of sort of interpreting the world, all of these different claims about, you know, how reality is and therefore how you should act in it. And I was, you know, a curious, you know, strange little child who always was interested in these big questions about, you know, life and death and how you should act. I was also really blessed by a public library that had a really excellent, you know, what they called world literature section. And they had this list of, you know, cl classics of world literature and for whatever reason, there was a list and I was like, I'm gonna read every book on that list. And it, it really like exposed me early on to things that were not familiar to me growing up. And so I always had this interest. And so then when I got to college at the University of Virginia, I was just sort of interested in taking a class or two that would complement my intended path of being a chemistry major and then ultimately a physician. And, you know, just happened to take a Buddhism class. And 
unbeknownst to me, because this was not part of my sort of plan for my life, University of Virginia has one of the best Tibetan Buddhism programs in the country. And so when I walked into that classroom, there was a wealth of knowledge, resources, community. You know, there was language resources. There was support for travel if students wanted to do research abroad. And so once I kind of walked through that door, I found this whole other world waiting for me. And the more that I learned about it, the more I wanted to learn about it. And so, you know, all these years later, um, I'm still learning new things and excited to learn so much more. That's amazing. I think what strikes me about both of the things you said about, you know, your upbringing in New Jersey, as well as your time at the University of Virginia is how, just how important access to certain types of resources are, right? It's about sort of not necessarily like forcing anybody to do anything, but just by virtue of, you know, these, you know, whether it's in your public library or whether it's at a university where liberal arts education is prized and a variety of different types of courses are offered. Um, that's kind of, yeah, it's so amazing to be exposed to things you're unfamiliar with and then find a passion for one of those things that you thought you had no connection to prior to that. I think that's- really Yeah. Amazing. And I'm reminded of, you know, 84,000's mission of translating things, right? Because I was somebody who, you know, was not gonna learn Sanskrit or Tibetan, didn't even have that capacity. Um, and just the ability to have something on a shelf that was in a language I was familiar with that then, you know, you read it and then you get sort of pulled in and want to learn more. But, you know, having that available to people, you know, right. provides this incredible gateway. Right. Yeah. I think that's definitely true. It's like we're constantly thinking about that, I think. I think both in the academic setting and the academy, as well as at 84,000 of trying to think about how to make things accessible. Um, and I think I'm, I also really, so this is, this gets to the, the next thing I want to ask you about gets to the heart of what I think I really would like to, I, I, that I haven't, something I haven't figured out myself, but kind of in the position that we're in, where we are kind of study, we study and we research something like Buddhist studies, right? Tibetan Buddhism in particular for both of us. Um, something we come up against a lot is how to negotiate kind of the academic study of Buddhism, as well as um, the studies that a Buddhist practitioner might do within the scope of Buddhist practice. I think that in the past, people tended to think that, you know, the difference between the two approaches of like the academic study of Buddhism and the practitioner's perspective that those were kind of in in attention with each other. Um, and this was this is especially true, I think, in a field like religious studies, where you have people in the field who subscribe to the religion and then you have people who don't, right? It's just out of intellectual curiosity that they're in the field. So um, I think today in the academy, this more parochial point of view is slowly changing of like, you know, these two perspectives can't be reconciled. I think that's changing and there's more acceptance, but I am curious about what your take on the matter is as someone who's gone through the kind of PhD program is now teaching at a university level. Um, what do you think the academic study, how, first of all, how would you define the academic study of Buddhism? And what do you think that sort of approach can offer to Buddhist practitioners and vice versa? what can practitioners of Buddhism who don't come from an academic background offer to academics who are studying Buddhism in the academy? Yeah, I think religious studies generally and Buddhist studies in particular has long thought that there's maybe, you know, sort of two broadly speaking approaches to the study of Buddhism, where you have the academic approach that kind of brackets your own personal beliefs and tries to, in an objective way, get closer to studying the history, the philosophy, the social development of these practices. And then, you know, perhaps on the other side to again, broadly characterize, you have a more devotional approach where folks are interested in studying the history and the philosophy and the text in order to sort of enrich their own practice. And, you know, for some folks, these are seen as oppositional approaches. And I, I know people on both sides of that divide who feel themselves to be in the minority and are almost nervous to talk about, you know, their personal commitment or lack thereof, um, because they fear that they'll be judged. And I think what's usefully changing is two things. You know, one is that these are now seen as more complementary 
than anything. Um, that, you know, perhaps we can locate the field of Buddhist studies as being a field. It's not that any one person's approach has to be the definitive approach and everyone else is wrong, but rather that together, these multiple perspectives are going to sort of enrich each other by challenging them, informing them, you know, and all of that sort of thing. Uh, the second thing that's changed is recognizing that these aren't two, you know, distinct approaches. There's more kind of a spectrum. And at various points in your career as either a scholar or a practitioner, you have to sort of put on both kinds of hats. So I'll give, you know, a quick example. If an academic is trying to study the history of Buddhism in an objective way, right? Um, objective, just, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be doing the history and, you know, I'm, I'm not, not going to involve my personal beliefs or feelings or concerns about, you know, ultimate questions in life. That person's going to miss that for all of Buddhist history, the folks reading and writing these texts were writing them for those kinds of reasons. So as a scholar, if you've just said that whole area is not what I'm interested in, you're, I would say that you're not being a good interpreter of those texts. So I think that scholars, what they can learn from practitioners um, is to appreciate the ways in which these texts aim to be transformative and are experienced as transformative. Um, and similarly, I think folks with a devotional appeal can learn from folks on the more sort of historical side that, you know, sometimes when we read a text in the modern period, we want to immediately apply it to our own lives, right? To say, this is speaking to me directly. And yes, that is sort of the ultimate goal if you're reading a, a text in a devotional way, but taking a step back and saying, okay, what did this text mean in its historical context? You know, what did this term, what are various ways that you could translate it? How does this text compare to other texts? Um, which kind of takes an extra step before it applies directly to you. Um, but it can be a helpful process in really figuring out what a text means, slowing you down as you read it and making sure that you're not projecting what you want the text to say onto it. And so in that way, I think that these two approaches can be mutually enriching. Yeah, that, thank you for that sort of really insightful response because it makes me think about how I think when someone's not in the kind of academic community encounters some of the scholarship that comes out about Buddhism and the history of Buddhism, um, they're often just encountering uh, studies that are very like piecemeal or they just encounter one article or one kind of a theory or, or one argument. And it's easy to take that and believe that, oh, that's what the scholars are saying about Buddhism. Whereas what you're pointing out is true reality. If people are in academia, they know nobody agrees on anything. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of argumentation back and forth on all sorts of topics anyway. And so it's important to keep that in mind and know that you know, for, so from the practitioner's point of view, I suppose it's, uh, you know, one way to kind of, yeah, it's just important to realize that, you know, if one scholar says this, I mean, yeah, that, that could be a valid point of view, but you should also see what others say, you know, what is the actual conversation surrounding this topic? And then at the same time, what you were saying about practitioners, you know, I think the academic study of Buddhism does offer, you know, there's like, there are studies now about things like, you know, the origin of like the words, you know, the words for mindfulness or things like that, that, that I actually think are really helpful because they are reminders that uh, when you try to trace the roots of certain concepts and practices in that way, they often have the effect of making people less sectarian, making people less prejudiced and biased against other Buddhists, I, I found, you know, when you realize that, oh, like certain interpretations of certain concepts that I hold to be, you know, 100% absolute actually have their origins in something that's much more, uh, you know, that allows for a lot more kind of degrees of variation. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it also just, you know, slows you down. I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, 84,000. Uh, you know, encourages folks to read sutras. And, you know, I was reading something recently, I forget exactly where on 84,000, was just like even one page a day, right? 
Because the temptation can be to say, okay, I got to get through as much of this as possible. There's 84,000 texts. That's a lot of reading. <laughs> um, I'm going to read it as fast as possible. Um, but actually really slowing down and paying attention and saying, well, what does this sentence mean? Um, and I think scholarship is the tool that can help us do that. Um, and, you know, in that same vein, it's also incumbent upon scholars to one, be a bit humble, right? Certainly some of these academic articles give the impression that scholars have fixed opinions about stuff because that can be the rhetoric that yeah. academics can have. And, you know, I think that scholars are still in the process of trying to understand even what it is that we're trying to do um, and, and maintaining that humility and also trying to be accessible and useful to the broader public is I think something that academics um, are getting better at. For sure, yeah, I, I, I like the emphasis on that, of always remembering um, that, you know, if possible, scholarship should help to enrich, you know, the general public and should be useful, even though, you know, a lot of times the type of research we're doing is very kind of focused on these minute details, but especially in a field like Buddhist studies, ultimately it really should hopefully um, be applicable in some way um, to the real world and, you know, to be helpful in that way. And I think your point about the academic approach really being an approach that emphasizes slow reading, close reading, I think that's very important. And for me, that is also something that I've really found to be valuable and that, you know, that I feel like I can apply to various aspects of my life as well. Yeah. Um, so related on a related topic, um, I would love to hear you talk more about Buddhist studies online because, um, you know, we were just talking about how often kind of the practitioner's perspective, the scholar's perspective can be seen as oppositional, but we, the two of us, and I feel like a growing number of scholars and the younger generation, and there's just, a, there's a lot of people who now see them as complementary. And um, I would love to hear about this new initiative. You know, if you could tell us a little bit about what the project is, what your impetus for establishing this platform was. And I was looking on the website um, and it says that, you know, the BSO describes itself as where the cushion meets the academy, making accessible the highest quality and most cutting edge research and teachings on Buddhism for students and practitioners around the world. So can you explain to us a little bit more about what worlds, what, what are the two worlds that you and your colleagues at BSO are trying to bridge? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So um, I'm the director of Buddhist Studies Online. Um, Buddhist Studies Online is essentially an online educational platform uh, devoted to offering four to six week long courses in the history, philosophy, and practices of Buddhism. These courses are taught by top professors in the field, but are aimed at a general audience. And they're meant to be you know, accessible, affordable, and high quality. And so you know, the reason that uh, the founder, Seth, um, and then myself, the director, um, the founder, Seth Powell, another Harvard person, and myself as the director, were motivated to start this was to say, so many folks these days are interested in Buddhism, in Zen, in mindfulness, in meditation, you know, all of these kinds of things. You can't walk into the grocery store without seeing a magazine with, you know, that on the cover about how to beat stress and all the things that affect us in our modern lives. There's a lot of interest there. Um, and, and sometimes that the materials available there are super high quality. There's a lot out there these days. But sometimes, especially if you're on social media, it can be, you know, kind of feel good, self-helpy type quotes attributed to the Buddha that don't necessarily seem to be particularly well sourced. Um, meanwhile, there's this academic field of Buddhist studies that exists, you know, almost entirely within the academy. And folks there are encouraged to write for other folks in that field, right? In some ways, it's almost a badge of honor for certain kinds of academics to write something that's so technical that only five people in the whole world are interested in it. And, you know, these two worlds, there are places where they intersect, but for the large, in large part, they seemed very separate um, to me and that folks who are interested 
and even wanted to learn more about the academic side, you know, but if they didn't have two years and a couple hundred thousand dollars to go to Harvard or to SOAS or to Oxford or any of these places, they, it just couldn't make yeah. it work. Even they yeah, felt there's no way. Yeah. Them. And so we wanted to bridge these two worlds of um, allowing folks who are interested in Buddhism, practicing it in various capacities, to interact with scholars who are at the top of their fields engaged in research, um, but are presenting it in a way that's kind of informative, challenging, but accessible to the general audience. And this was a model pioneered by yogic studies, which so the founder of Buddhist Studies Online founded yogic studies about three years ago, had a lot of success and interest because again, yoga is one of these things that lots of folks do, but don't necessarily know about the history, academic fields, that is very insular, um, wanted to bridge those worlds. And so particularly during COVID, when so many of us are at home with only our computers, folks you know, had more opportunity to take online education, take another look at that. And yeah. so we wanted to help create courses that folks could do. And we are currently in our third course. We had one just introduction to Buddhism that was taught by me. Uh, we had Buddhist meditation in theory and practice taught by Daniel Stewart of the University of South Carolina. And currently are doing Indian Buddhist philosophy taught by Karen Myers of the Mangalam Research Center. And so, and our next one is Buddhist Studies 201 on the Bodhicharya Avatara taught by Jay Garfield. And so all of these are meant to be complementary to whatever practice or sometimes lack of practice people have. We're not teaching meditation. We're not taking the place of experienced and trained lineage-based teachers. We think that there's good people who are doing that. Um, but for folks who want to complement that with a bit more on the academic side, uh, that's where we see our sort of place in this broader ecosystem. That's great. Um, yeah, and it's, it's from the roster of scholars who will be teaching the courses. It sounds really amazing. I mean, these really sound like the type of courses that, you know, a student in a master's program in Buddhist studies or, you know, an early stage doctoral student, these are the types of courses they might encounter. So I think it's, yeah, I mean, if I really think about it prior to this, it's, it's really true, you know, unless you were affiliated with a particular kind of sectarian organization or you had your own teachers, you didn't really, you know, it was hard for the general public to have access to courses like this, where, you know, you don't have to be part of a certain group, you don't have to know certain people, but if you're interested in a topic, you know, related to Buddhism um, that, you know, scholars have studied, for a while, uh, there was no place really to, you know, take courses like that. If you didn't, like you said, if you didn't have two years to spare, if you didn't have time to go get another degree, you know, where would, where do you, unless the only route, I guess, would be to kind of find books on your own and try to read up. But um, yeah, so I think it's great. Do you want to pop in um, the website URL in the chat, just so that people can access the website if they're interested? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just BuddhistStudiesOnline.com, um, and so I just put that in the the chat. Although I think is the ch I think I just chatted it to hosts and panelists, so I'm going to chat it to everyone. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Yeah, we're after a year of Zoom. We're um we're all like forgetting our Zoom skills now that we have to go back to in person mm -hmm. teaching. Yeah, and it's been amazing um, already to sort of encounter some of the students. For instance, we've had a couple of folks um, who have been ordain, ordained Zen priests and they'll say, you know, I've been practicing in Zen for 20 years. You know, I have my lineage-based education. I have my teachers. Um, but I'm interested to learn almost more about the context of Buddhism as a whole and where it fits into it. Um, or we've had folks who say, you know, I've been studying as a Christian chaplain and, you know, more and more of my patients are interested in meditation and mindfulness. And I just want to learn mm -hmm. something about that. Or folks say, you know, I've read a book or two by Thich Nhat Hanh or the Dalai Lama. And um, for many people, perhaps some of the folks in the audience can relate to this, like just reading it on a page can feel a little bit dry. Um, and so having that sort of dynamic interaction with an instructor provides you yeah. know more of an entry point and the goal is always that 
our courses are sort of a beginning to further exploration. For sure, right. Yeah, I mean, as we all know, it really makes a difference to have a, a good teacher. It makes a difference to have a community of other learners and students. So yeah, I just think it's great to have this new online resource. Um, I want to, maybe I'll ask you about resources a little bit more later as well, because I think that you would be able to share with us a lot of different types of resources for further exploration um, that I think our audience members would be interested in. But I'm also really curious to hear about your um, year at the University of Wyoming. So you are now an assistant professor at Buddhist Studies there. Um, and I would just love to hear about what your experiences have been so far, you know, what for you um, has been interesting about teaching Buddhism to university level students who might not have any, ex have had any exposure to something like Buddhism. Um, you know, why do you feel that it's important to teach them, you know, um, Buddhism at this level? And what do you think it offers the university at large? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are great questions. And it's been such a, a fun year here. You know, so I started in August 2020, which was a strange time to move to a new place and, you know, uh, get integrated into the university. We were largely online for a long time, um, but it's been a great year. And so I think broadly of Buddhist studies of having something to say to like three large kinds of audiences. And so the first we can say broadly is this sort of maybe Dharma audience that we've been talking about so far. So folks who are interested and have some degree of Buddhist practice themselves and are, you know, interested in what academia can uh, do for folks in this group is to, yeah, provide resources for people to sort of support their study, um, to help explain, to bring to light texts that otherwise would be inaccessible, to provide frameworks for perhaps how to think about um, you know, how to understand the tradition and its historical development. I think another audience um, is, is folks within Buddhist studies. So folks in a sort of like really historical or philosophical bent. Um, you know, so I think about this audience when I'm doing a lot of my research that, you know, there's probably a handful of people in the world who really, really care about, you know, what this one guy said in the 16th century about the, the controversy over Tise. Um, and so writing for that audience that really wants to kind of nail down the history of even things that even a Dharma audience says, this is way too technical and boring. And then the third audience, which gets to what I'm doing at the University of Wyoming, is a kind of broad humanities audience. And I'm thinking in particular of the US audience, but analogous ones exist in various sorts of countries. So my students here at the University of Wyoming are largely white, largely rural, largely Christian. The majority of them have never met a Buddhist in their lives, or if they have, they weren't aware of it. And so my teaching at the University of Wyoming is largely oriented towards saying, okay, maybe you've heard the word mindfulness, maybe you've seen a Buddha. Um, they've, they, they, think, think, they think that the Buddha is the, like the fat, happy, laughing Buddha that maybe you'll see at a restaurant. <laughs> um, but beyond that, they don't really know much of anything. And indeed they may be, what they have heard is, is part of a, a cult, a package of saying, well, you know, Buddhists are good and Muslims are bad, you know, so, something of that nature that they're really just not so exposed to these kinds of world religions. And so what I'm trying to do for my students here at the university is kind of a twofold project, introduce them to something new that they've never sort of had the chance to study before you know, and Buddhism offers radically different ways of thinking about the nature of the self, how we exist in community, how we sort of function on an everyday basis, the kinds of mental states that we could attain if we were to train ourselves. So throw them in the deep end of all these different ways of looking at reality. But then in the process of encountering this new thing, also have them reflect on what they brought to the class and how encountering this new thing to them brings out the kind of assumptions and presumptions that they had about the world, the things that they thought were normal and unquestioned um, so that they can become more self-aware and recognize that the things that they assumed were true about the world are 
perhaps particular to where they grew up. Um, and so be able to enter the world in this more kind of self-aware, interested in others and open to learning uh, kind of approach. That's, that's amazing. I, I think that we're, we're both really passionate about teaching as part of this academic career. And I think that's one of the most powerful things when you realize that you are able to offer a perspective that students maybe never considered before. A perspective that we, because we study this type of thing, you know, take for granted sometimes. Um, but, you know, sometimes students, I mean, students, you know, as someone who's, you know, who has to serve as teaching assistants, pro professors here at Harvard, I mean, even Harvard students who you might assume, you know, are more cosmopolitan, have had much more privilege, have been exposed to a lot of, a lot more ideas um, in the world, you know, they have, very, very limited ideas about Buddhism as well. You know, what Buddhism is, what Buddhism should be. Um, and it's always interesting to kind of, uh, you know, show them the kind of diversity of what Buddhism can be. So I, I, um, I think that's really interesting. What about can you share with us some of the courses that you've taught so far at the University of Wyoming? What types of, you know, th this is also interesting because it also gets to, you know, what a, a public university like the University of Wyoming is asking a professor like you to offer, you know, like what, what, what are the kind of guidances they give you? And then how do you formulate your syllabus? Um, and what types of, yeah, basically what types of courses have you taught so far? What do you want to teach in the future? Yeah, and so it's, it's also interesting, you know, to think about this way that the university has a certain kind of mission and also has certain kinds of constraints. You know, I am encouraged to teach things that will get butts in chairs, you know, so that our department has enough people and therefore enough sort of, um, you know, resources coming into it and that we're encouraged to sort of frame what we do in terms of the university's mission, uh, which often is oriented towards career preparation. So, you know, I'm encouraged to frame what I do in terms of how this will help Wyoming students get jobs, you know, and that may be quite different from, you know, what I would be doing if I was given total free reign, not that I don't want my students to get jobs, um, but I do also want them to think that, yeah, the eight hours a day that they spend in their jobs, that's a third of their life. Um, but that's not the entirety of their experience. They are human beings and as such face the problems associated with being human beings. And it's worth thinking about those together and with the resources that the past has sort of given to us. And so I'm always trying to answer to sort of different kinds of audiences and different kinds of masters. You know, I always look to the example of the Buddha in terms of skillful means and being able to speak to people in ways that are, make sense to them. Um, you know, not that I am <laughs> claiming any ability towards upaya or skillful means, um, but just, you know, how you position yourself is, is so important if you want to be heard and want to have the opportunity to continue teaching. So to that end, when I got here, I just taught a sort of intro to Buddhism class and you know, starting with, um, you know, the sort of context of the Indian philosophical and social world before in the time, sort of before the Buddha emerged, looking at how Buddhism emerged, how it was sort of formulated according to what we think about the early history of Buddhism, and then tracing Buddhism as it moves and develops, you know, through India, up to China and East Asia, and Tibet. And so just a broad overview survey course that was structured around the idea of the Buddhist path. So what is the sort of starting point that most of us find ourselves at at the beginning of that path? What's our ordinary kind of suffering like? What is the solution to that suffering? And then what are the different ways, what's the ways to get from one to the other? And then looking at ways that this conception of the Buddhist path has shifted over time as Buddhism moves to these new times and places. I also taught a Buddhist ethics class. And so, you know, I always have a copy of the Bodhicharya Avatara at hand. Uh, this is my favorite Buddhist text, read it all the time, learn something new every time. 
I think so they I have two, of, two translations up there. Yeah. Yep. Um, and there's, you know, great translations. Um, it's, and it's always fun to look at different translations too, just to be like, oh, there's multiple ways to understand this. Um, so we spent 10 weeks going through this chapter by chapter, because this is Shantideva's account of um, Buddhist moral phenomenology, an, almost an account of psychology and how it is that we ordinarily react and then how that could be gradually transformed. And so we spent 10 weeks really slowly going through that text. And then the last four weeks, we looked at some contemporary issues, one sort of systemic racism, the other one climate change. And these are both really interesting issues because they affect all of us today. And they're also something that the Buddha <laughs> never really thought about, never really wrote about. They weren't on the radar in fifth century BCE. And yet the question of what it means to take Buddhist ethics and you know, sort of apply it or live it in the modern world mm -hmm. raises all of these really interesting questions um, about how, you know, Shantideva writing in the eighth century BCE speaks to our contemporary period. Wow. I also teach classes that are just intro to world religions in which <laughs> each world religion gets a week, maybe a week and a half uh, for some of the bigger ones. And I taught religions of Asia, I'm also teaching currently a Tibetan Buddhism class and then another section of religions of Asia. And again, this is oriented towards assuming that my students have no background in this, will probably not think about it after I teach them. And so you get this one 15 week opportunity to say, okay, what do I want them to take away about, you know, religions of Asia or Buddhism right. or whatever topic we're talking about. Right. So my follow up question to that is, um, so you mentioned, you know, you use Shantideva's text a lot for your Buddhist ethics course, but for your intro Buddhism course, for example, what types of texts did you use? I think this might be of interest to our audience as well. You know, what did you ask students to read? Um, what are some, did, you know, did you ever teach with sutras, for example? Um, uh, what types of textbooks did you use? Is there something that you might recommend? to our audience members if they're looking for something that's slightly academic, but accessible. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I got up to grab it. So when I'm teaching at the university context, you kind of have two options. One is to assign a textbook. And the textbook is kind of a modern scholar writing, trying to summarize things and trying to, you know, give a kind of clear picture to students who have never studied this subject before. And there's lots of wonderful textbooks and they can be great resources. But I largely like to go this second route, which is to assign largely primary sources. And so the difference between you know, a primary source and a secondary source is a primary source is something that was written by and for Buddhists in the past, as opposed to a secondary source, which is a modern scholar writing about the past, you know, usually based on primary sources. And then also a tertiary source, is an introductory textbook that's summarizing a lot of scholarship. And I like to work with primary sources because I think that that allows students to encounter the tradition as directly as possible. And, you know, I put that directly as possible there because obviously we are separated by time and space and the various ways in which these texts would have been lived in reality. Um, but reading the words that Buddhists have written and that Buddhists have been reading for thousands of years, I think is important because it allows students, again, to be learning from the tradition itself, guided by me, as opposed to learning from me talking about their tradition. And so I place myself as a kind of guide on the side rather than lecturing to them about stuff. And this is really difficult, right? Anyone who's tried to read a sutra will know that they're not always the most reader friendly. They're not written in a style that we're used to. They use words that we don't know what they mean. They can be kind of long and especially for Buddhist texts, really repetitive. And so students often feel very alienated at first. They say, what's going on here? Um, but we talk about how to read these texts together. And you know, I promise them you will get better at this. And over the course of the semester, they really do. And the wonderful thing about primary source texts is that they are 
sort of difficult and surprising and challenging, and you have to wrestle with them. And so the, the main book that I use is this Norton Anthology of World Religions, Buddhism. Mm -hmm. This is edited by Donald Lopez. And so what's really nice about this book is that it has introductions. So it gives you a whole picture, but then the main part of the book is that you get short excerpts of text. They're usually 10 to 20 pages. So short enough that I can assign them to my students and have them actually do the reading. Mm -hmm. Usually a two to three page introduction that contextualizes the reading. And so I like a book like this because it balances giving you a lot of primary sources, lots of excerpts of primary sources um, with enough material that you feel supported, right? As opposed to just totally diving in blind. Right. So just to clarify, this anthology has excerpts from things like sutras and other types of Buddhist primary sources. And before each text, there's a scholarly explanation by a scholar of some sort who specializes in that particular text. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so it provides a general overview. You know, obviously right. something that's going to be trying to summarize 2,500 years of history is going right. to leave big gaps. But you go from, you know, the Aganya Sutta and things from the Jatakas to the Dhammachaka Pavatthana Sutta, the Buddha's first sermon, um, Metta Sutta, the Sudhimagga, Amidharma Kosha, all get excerpts. Then you move into a Mahayana section. Mm. Tantra, China, Japan, Tibet. And mm. so in terms of both getting you in contact with the primary source material, which I think I share with 84,000, like the goal of really like making the direct stuff accessible with a scholarly introduction that's gonna help you and sort of a broad attempt at being comprehensive. For sure, it, yeah. You, you know, some things are really expensive. This book is not one of those super expensive kinds of books. That's great. That's great. I, that's not a book that I've actually worked with. So I think it's, thank you for sharing that. And I think I, I, I already see notes of appreciation from our audience members. Um, yeah, I mean, you're definitely right. I think 84,000 also, you know, it's just, it, it's great to have secondary sources that explain material, that analyze material, but it's so important to have the primary sources available. And for students and for anyone to realize that, look, you know, over millennia, people have interpreted things differently, but let's read what the actual words were or try to get at them as best we can. And, you know, with 84,000's publications online, there's also introductions by our editors that are very um, academically oriented as well that try to contextualize and explain each sutra. Um, so, uh, so I can see that um, everyone is uh, very interested in all of this. And so can you share with us some other online resources that you often go to or that you point students to if they're interested in learning more? You know, if a student takes your intro to Buddhism class um, and they finish it and they wanna, they're still interested, where do you point them? What can they find online? Mm -hmm. There's, there's so much that's online these days. And particularly, you know, you know, I'm imagining a student who's interested and you can ask, you know, lots of kinds of questions and direct them to particular sorts of things. Um, and so I'll just give, you know, a couple of areas and, and, and ways that one can explore deeper. Um, for folks interested in art history, the Rubin Museum in particular has amazing online resources. Um, and I'm going to type all these things in the chat as well. Oh, you can, you, uh, yeah, I, I can type and you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, Himalayanart.com is also mm -hmm. a really good one in that respect. Um, I also think that there's a lot of really good stuff for someone who's generally interested in Buddhism on Tricycle. So mm. if you go to tricycle.com, Tricycle, the Buddhist magazine, they will have a range of things, you know, ranging from more sort of contemporary Buddhist teachers speaking to that, to scholars who, if you're a scholar and want to write something accessible, Tricycle is often one of the places that you do it. Tricycle also has a nice Buddhism for beginners section that actually will have sort of explainers that if you're like, okay, what is dependent origination? You know, and they've got a couple paragraphs. 
Lotsawa House is fantastic. They've got a lot of translations available. And indeed, one of the, you know, great translations of the Bodhicharya Avatar that isn't this one is available totally for free at Losawa House. Um, I also think that we're, we're used to being a little bit skeptical about Wikipedia, which is a wise thing to be. The Wikipedia pages for Buddhism are often much better than you would think. And I know that that's because some scholars that I know assign to students the task of updating these pages or writing these pages and you know, sourcing them well. You know, so it's always a matter of making sure that you know, things are sourced well. Um, but Wikipedia is actually the first place that I will often go to if I'm looking to get you know, just you know, a quick and dirty account of a, a source. A Rigpa Wiki, I'm seeing that Lopsang in the chat um, mentioned that. Um, and it's sort of in the style of a Wikipedia, but often sort of for a Dharma audience. Then, um, ooh, something just <laughs> totally evaporated from my head. Um, there's also great resources in terms of, oh, that was it, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Oh, yes, yeah. Yes. So sometimes, you know, folks will be particularly interested in the philosophy side. Some folks won't be, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Some of the Stanford mm -hmm. Encyclopedia articles are really dense, but if you want to get a sense of, okay, what's the range of ways that Yogacara th thinkers thought about the nature of reality, or what is Buddhist philosophy of language all about? Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is a really great place to go. I also mm -hmm. saw that someone earlier in the chat, um, Tatiana Taveras perhaps, um, mm -hmm. if I'm pronouncing that right, was asking questions about language study, in particular, you know, either Tibetan or Sanskrit. And so there's a couple places that I'll steer students to if they're looking to study languages. Um, so for Tibetan, if you're interested in studying Tibetan, I would say one of the best places to go is Rangjung Yeshe's institutes mm -hmm. um, in Kathmandu, Nepal, although they also have online formats. And you can do that totally self-study. I know Connie Kasser, recorded a lot of intro um, Tibetan materials. And both Joy and I have spent a good chunk of time at Rangjung Yeshi, it's wonderful. For Sanskrit in particular, yogic studies. So Buddhist studies online is the, the educational platform that I'm the director of. Our sister site, yogic studies actually has Sanskrit courses, both at the first year level and at the second year level that are, um, much less expensive than a lot of the options. And you're working with Antonia Rupel, uh, who uh, is an amazing Sanskrit teacher. Yes, uh, this feeling of getting lost uh, if you don't have a structured approach and if you're not working with a teacher is I think what prevents a lot of people from getting more engaged with these resources. Like maybe one day you have a lot of enthusiasm, you go, you click a whole bunch of links, you got all your tabs open, and then you feel overwhelmed and just totally shut down. So having a teacher and a guide is often a really good thing. And so, yeah, I'd say Rangjung Yeshe for Tibetan, yogic studies for Sanskrit are great places to start uh, for That's languages. Great. We also have a question um, from Mandy um, in Toronto about courses for children. Do you have any recommendations um, she's specifically asking about courses for kids age three to seven, but I would be curious to know if you think there are resources that are particularly good for children, whether it's books or courses or websites. This is such a great question and I love it. Um, and because it's something that I don't, I feel like I don't necessarily um, have, I haven't thought about this enough, but yes, resources for kids are such an important thing, right? Because uh, kids are so curious about the world um, and ask so many questions. And so often we as adults kind of fail to take those questions really seriously and nurture those interests. And then by the time that you're starting study, you know, maybe if you get to the college level and you start taking a class, you're already working with all of these kinds of other ideas in your head. The one thing that's occurring to me is, um, 
that how many towns and another scholar of Tibetan Buddhism mm, that wrote a Townsend, children's yeah. book about Shanti Deva. Oh wow! And it's a picture book, so it has like wonderful illustrations. But it's a retelling of Shanti Deva's teaching, and so it's the same author as this book. I can put the link for that in the chat. Right. And I've seen this yeah. book just so beautifully illustrated. Yeah. So I know that actually. So Shambhala, the publisher. Um, now has a children's book in print um, called, I, I believe it's called Bala Kids. And they have been publishing some really amazing storybooks for children. Um, I took a look last year at one called The Life of the Buddha. Um, and it was a very simple and elegant retelling just with gorgeous illustrations. And, but they also have a lot of other types of storybooks that deal with you know, Buddhist topics that it's not ostensibly, you know, the title is not Buddhism or anything like that, but it deals with compassion and, you know, ethics and things like that. Um, and just really cute illustrations and great stories. So um, people can definitely take a look at that and see what they're publishing. I know that they're, they're doing a lot these days. And Buddhism has so many wonderful stories. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the Jatakas in particular featuring animals that are, you know, so accessible, so understandable, and that convey a lot of these deep ideas. Um, but in a way that like you talk about them with kids and the kids get it. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at the page for Shambhala kids right now. Yeah. And uh, it looks like they also have a lot of like resource guides. So, you know, if you're a parent looking to read these, th these things with your child, you know, maybe the child and you read the book together, but then you also have the resource guide to maybe know how to raise questions and things of that nature. Yeah. It's like, that's a really cool opportunity. Yeah, I agree. Um, we have a question from Eugene Lau. Oh, thank you for putting the link in there. Um, I think people appreciate that. Uh, we have a question from Eugene Lau about BSO, Buddhist Studies Online 101. I think that's your intro Buddhism course. Uh, do you also cover the Theravada and Vajrayana aspects in that course? What's the approach of that course? What, what, what do you cover? Mm -hmm. So the course is structured over six modules. And mm -hmm. so I can, you know, so you have sort of each module consists of a 90 minute pre-recorded video lecture, um, a set of readings, again, largely taken from this Norton anthology. And then um, there's a 90 minute live Q and A session that was live when the course was live, but then those get recorded and put up. So anyone who is going to watch it later, that's been pre-recorded. But then if you know if you enroll in one of our live courses, those are live. And so and then there's also a quiz. And so for each module you have the, the lecture, the readings, the Q and A, and then the quiz. And so for the six modules of uh, Buddhist Studies Online 101, the course that I taught, which was intro to Buddhism, history, philosophy, and practices. We spent one module introducing the Buddha and his world. So introducing kind of Buddhist cosmology, you know, what was the world as it would have been understood at the time of the Buddha? Um, and what was the sort of problem with that world from the Buddha's perspective? You focus on, you know, who was the Buddha? How did he get to be the Buddha? Including, you know, past lives leading all the way up to that. The second module is focused on the Buddhist teachings. Um, so really on the earliest teachings as scholars understand them, really taking a deep dive into like what we know about those teachings, how they relate to one another. Um, and again, how they connect to this problem of overcoming suffering. The third one is called How to Change Your Mind, Monks, Morality and Meditation. And so it looks at the monastic community and the practices that they undertake. Um, because one of the things that scholars will always sort of say is that in the time of the Buddha, meditation would have been seen as something that was a relatively elite practice. Most people would not have seen it as something that they wanted to do in particular. And so, um, you know, looking at sort of Buddhist monastic elites and the kind of practices associated with them. And in that module, we also take a look at Theravada Buddhism and Theravada, is often sort of held to be equivalent to early Buddhism. And that can be problematic for various reasons because Theravada Buddhism has gone through 2,500 years of history just as Mahayana Buddhism has. Um, but they are sort of 
somewhat more closely related insofar as Theravada takes itself to have a relatively conservative doctrinal approach. Uh, then in module four, we look at Mahayana, the developments in India, and then as Buddhism starts to move out. Module five is how to get enlightened fast, Chan, Zen, and Tantra. And so that looks at Buddhism as it sort of moves to these other places in East Asia and Tibet. And then finally, we do Buddhism and modernity and thinking about the future mm. of Buddhism. And so, you know, Theravada and Vajrayana both each get their chunks, although those are things that we're hoping to expand in the future with their own courses. Right. I mean, for a survey course that really covers a lot of ground already, it really tries to cover the gamut of Buddhist history. So, but then of course, that's just the beginning, you know, for further exploration. So we are approaching um, the end of our hour, but I thought what I would love to ask you um, as a closing question is, you know, I think often when you, in during the first lecture, for a course like Intro Buddhism, you're often trying to convince students why they should take the course, right? There's a, you know, the professor is making a statement about why this course is important for you, for your education as a human being. So what do you say to your students? Um, what would you say to your students about why they should take a course at a university on Buddhism? What do you think they will get from it? And then the second part of that question is, what have you found most rewarding so far about teaching Buddhism in the university setting? Mm -hmm. So I often make my pitch to students on, you know, a couple of levels and I start with the things that I think that they already care about, you know, so one, I'll say to them, this is going to help you in your career because, you know, we could teach you how to program a computer. We could teach you how to, you know, do something really technical. And in five years, all the tech specs will have changed and you're gonna to have to like learn something entirely new. So actually some of the best job skills you can have to approach the world is to take a step back and think about how to learn, right? How do you approach a body of material that's entirely new to you? How do you learn how to read something in a way that says, okay, here's the argument that's being made, here's the supporting evidence. How do you communicate what you said? And so in all of my classes, I emphasize that these kind of really important fundamental soft skills of uh, your job are going to be emphasized. <laughs> you know, gradually we're gonna build up, so don't worry, I'm not gonna stop there. Um, the second one is that we live in an increasingly globalized world, um, especially for my students from Wyoming. If they stay in their hometowns, they might have thought that they wouldn't have to worry about you know, the fact that our world is becoming increasingly interconnected, but that's just not true anymore. And so um, you need to learn how to encounter others, how to encounter difference, because not encountering it, one is just ignoring reality, and two, it's denying yourself the opportunity to learn from folks around the world. Um, so just like becoming a global citizen, as opposed to a citizen of perhaps your rural small town in Wyoming. And then the last thing that I tell students that's important is like, you are going to die. <laughs> Everyone you love is going to die. And on the way, they will get sick. They will face troubles. You will um, have moments of crisis and despair. You will have moments of great joy and happiness and contentment, but you'll also just, by virtue of being human, face these really difficult circumstances. And you're not alone in that. that. That is part of what it is to be human. And the best time to deal with those kinds of horrible circumstances is not when you're right in the midst of them, when you're feeling like you're drowning and being overwhelmed, but to spend some time thinking right at this moment of transition where a lot of college students are you know, transitioning from being kids to being adults, determining their place in the world. Um, to think about how you want to structure your life. What is it that you value? What are the things that might come up that are going to be horrible and stressful? What are the things that you do that might contribute to making those things worse? And how might you avoid that path? Um, but then also, how do you confront your sort of inevitable morality and mor mortality and live in a way that when you die, you can look back and say, you know, you know, I, I feel good about that. And so that's my pitch to students is that this is part of the project of being human 
and that you don't have to be human alone. You can be human with others and taking advantage of the ways that traditions have passed down wisdom. You don't always have to agree with it. Most of my students are not gonna agree with most of the stuff that we read, but just thinking with others is going to help you when you face these inevitable difficult moments. And so I think that that is what has been most useful to me as well of having frameworks in place, of having certain practices in place that when I reach these points of you know, moral failing or facing a difficult circumstance, you're able to say, you know, in this moment, I'm feeling like how Shinran feels when he's writing in the Tani show. Like, I'm gonna go read that. And I'm gonna feel some connection with another human who is writing in a very different time and place, or I'm gonna go read this particular sutra and it's, it's gonna help me. Um, and I've really felt that that has been such an important and rewarding part of studying Buddhism professionally is getting to just really um, think with um, great folks in the Buddhist tradition when I'm feeling lost. Thank you so much. I want to take your course. <laughs> if um, the pitch you made was fantastic and very moving, um, I and might be something that I will steal from you for future courses <laughs> that I may teach. But yes, I think that you have really highlighted the types of frameworks for thinking about life that I think Buddhism and Buddhist studies can uniquely offer to the humanities and to students, um, whether at the university level, the master's level, or at any level who, you know, people who already have jobs but are just interested in exploring more. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, Kate. It really was, it was really nice to speak to you, to hear your perspective on a variety of topics and also um, thank you for sharing so many resources. I think there are certain, you know, resources that are not difficult to access, but if you don't know about them, you don't know about them, you know. Um, so your book suggestions and website suggestions were really great. Thank you for that. Um, and lastly, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, thank you for joining us and see you next time for the next episode of 84,000 in Conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much.